Dr. Shwajma has received her PhD from Manipal Center for Humanities, that is Manipal Academy of Higher Education. And she completed her master's in arts and aesthetics from Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. While pursuing her PhD, she was the curator of KK Hebar Art Gallery at Manipal. And she is the grand recipient of, of Foundation for Indian Contemporary Art Research Fellowship. She has been a resident curator at Delfina Foundation London and the International Studio and Curatorial Program New York. And um, she's also a part of an ongoing uh, curatorial project with the Guild Art Gallery, that is Alibag Bombay, uh, which is primarily focused at the life and art of Indian artist Akbar Padamsi, who is one among the many pioneers of modern Indian painting. Um, uh, she's also, uh, among her other curatorial projects, there are also including included Backstage of Biology that she did in 2019 at Archive at National Center for Biological Sciences, Bangalore, and Vectors of Kinship, that is 2016, at the 11 Shanghai Biennale. So her academic writing has been published in journals such as Ethical Perspectives, Voices in Biotech, Deleuze and Guattari Studies. So, and she's presently um, an assistant professor of philosophy at School of Interwoven Arts and Sciences at Korea University, India. So now, as you see that uh, Dr. Shrajna is not just theoretically involved in the study of aesthetics, she is also practically involved in the domain of art as a curator and her curatorial projects span across themes and topics. So Dr. Shrajna, we are ready, with you, ready for you. Please go ahead with your session. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you, Tanima, for the very elaborate introduction. Uh, it reminded me who I am, <laughs> because sometimes we forget. Thanks, Arjun. Thanks, everyone. Hi, uh, Srinivas. Uh, nice to see you. And some known faces. Faisal is there. Vivek is there. Others, I do not know. Maybe if you can switch on your video, whoever can, and say hi, it will make it more uh, engaged. And at least I have a face to the name. I have Laura's face, Natasha's face, so that is nice to know. Um, we will make this interactive. Oh, hi, Pramod. Hello. Uh, okay, I see Kumar, S. Kumar, and then hi, Faisal, Laura, all right, Shishira. Is this our Nina from Shishira? Everyone wondering. No, but it's the same name. Ashok, and I don't know, there's a user, I don't know the name. So, but today, I think uh, in the morning, oh, that's Ashok, okay. Somebody's raised his hand. All right, so we're not taking attendance, don't worry. So it's just very nice to see all of you. And uh, I mean, I think it will be a very relaxed session and engaging session, I'll make you do a little bit. So make you do something. So that's, uh, I hope you will not mind it. And I think in the morning, Rinald spoke to you at length. I'm, I'm sure it must have been exhaustive, foundational, you must have had, be having halos on your head by now because uh, he is a, sort of an encyclopedic uh, mind. Uh, I will try to make it more exercise-based, more uh, engaging. And the, uh, the topic that I thought we will try to think around is aesthetics, okay? And the larger function and role and relevance of this thing that we call aesthetics. It's a very daunting word. It's a very big word. But what does it even mean and why is it relevant, especially if you are students who are coming here to do a degree in Indian philosophy and uh, Sanskrit studies, not, I mean, forget just philosophy, but it is also a specific area, right? That is a master's area. Why would we be engaging in this particular field called aesthetics? And it's a very uh, intentional gesture because it is placing the role of aesthetic, the centrality of this field called aesthetics amidst what we can imagine to be, call as the philosophy from the global south, okay? So I have a PPT, so I'm gonna share it. And I'm going to also run you through some videos. And uh, so I hope all of you, uh, I mean, you all know each other, right? There's an icebreaker session and things like that. So you won't mind if I group you into breakout rooms and make you do something. Is that okay? Uh, all right. 
So let me share my screen. Are you able to see the screen? Yeah. Okay. Also, feel free to unmute yourself and speak. I will totally rely on your participation here. I will throw some questions at you, so I will ask you to speak. Okay. Uh, so I'll keep this so that I have a. So. The title itself has a lot to unpack from. So it's a little bit of a spin. It's also a pun on Shakespeare in English. So in Shakespeare in English, we, we use art instead of are. So instead of what are we, we would have said, what are we? But here I am, of course, putting, putting a spin on it and talking about art instead. So these three key words that we see here, what are we, actually are super signifiers of uh, entire trajectories of philosophical investigation, right? And for example, if we deal with the question of what, all those things where we are trying to ask the question what, right? Can anyone, perhaps those who already have an inkling of what philosophy does, the question what and which stream of philosophy are we trying to engage with when we ask the question what? Would anyone have an idea? What is dash dash? What is dash dash? Anyone can give it a try. Maybe I'll call out a name and then hopefully you don't mind. Uh, Amrita? Hello. Uh, I'm sorry, I am not very familiar with Hi. your, I'm not a student of the program, <laughs> um, actually from uh, Department oh, okay. of Languages and I happen to be interested in uh, art and curatorial practices and so I'm tuning oh, Very in. good, okay. I, thanks. Good to know that you're from the languages. Still, <laughs> I would want to ask what, <laughs> uh, do you want to pass on the baton to somebody who is from the program? Uh, yeah, I can do that. With an... um, perhaps uh, Vivek? Vivek is not in the program. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. Um, but, Natasha then. Hey, hi, Vivek is here. What do you want me to answer? Oh. No, you're not from the program. Stay out of it. I can answer. You want, people to answer. You want me to answer the discipline of philosophy <laughs> okay. that, that deals with the question what? The question what, what is? Ah, it's ontology, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Thanks. So uh, when we're talking about questions regarding what is, right? The smaller I understanding is the discipline of ontology that you're engaging with, but we're also, it's falling under the largest question of metaphysics. And metaphysics is that discipline of philosophy which is trying to understand the nature of reality, the nature of things around us, the nature of all that we encounter. So the what is a very key question, the key W, one of the key W questions for metaphysical inquiry, right? Now, and when we talk about art, of course, I'm alluding to the focus question of today's session, which is aesthetics and we, what are we, right? So it is a very uh, invested relational question where we're trying to understand who we are, our place in this entire uh, you know, discipline and an understanding of the self and the other, an understanding of perhaps a collective identity through this discipline that we call aesthetics, okay? So when we talk about the first instance of our culture, okay? When I say our cultures, it can be one culture, it can be multiple cultures. It is a, a, totally up for interpretation. Uh, we talk about this idea of when was these first creative expressions of our cultures found? What is the first instance where we can think about uh, quote unquote art as something to have emerged, right? And we directly then can think about caves, the cavemen, okay? Just going back in history, 
us as cave people spending uh, uh, the whole uh, daytime hunting gathering nomadic uh, really you know doing other things outside as a very active tribe and then coming back to our homes that were actually uh, you know holes in nature in on, under the rock or in various different geographical locations and then there's a lot of idle time or perhaps then there is a lot of boredom you never know perhaps there is a lot of anger frustration they wouldn't get a uh, something to eat or they couldn't get their hunt or there is a, a feeling of jubilation or perhaps they are uh, elated with something and then they express and perhaps then we want to think about how they may have expressed themselves right and we have the first instances of cave paintings that emerge cave paintings as that first instance of a uh, human beings the anthropocene that we call human beings as a culture trying to express its existence reflect with the world around them become mirrors for the world as well as uh, you know windows towards opening new worlds right and this is for example an image from the bimbetka caves which were done in 1500 to 2000 bc very ancient prehistoric and yet the the joy of actually meeting time across two generations in the present is only possible when we are talking about art objects or art artifacts and historical uh, relics here let us just dive into a small foray into the cave okay and i'm going to take you through various experiences so just indulge okay for a moment because for uh, for the creative being for example uh, something like the cave is extremely fascinating so we look at what does it mean to be in a cave and a small foray into one of these caves and how uh, these cave paintings emerged okay so let me just share uh, stop share okay So are you able to hear the video? Yes. Yes, very well. Yes, okay. Not uh This cave mouth in northern Spain has been inhabited for 150,000 years. There's basic shelter here and safety. But from time to time they left the light behind and headed into the dark. In these caves, you see the transition from just surviving to living, to observing the world, to enjoying it. There were gatherings here, people coming together to make art and not just any old art but specific representations of particular animals and particular symbols so in these caves we see the beginnings of superstition the beginnings of an appreciation that there's a present that there's a past and there's a future These early artists were leaving messages to future generations. And the one that speaks loudest lies far deeper into the darkness.
This handprint was made by a child at least 35,000 years ago. It's thought it was made by a little girl. She would have done the painting by taking paint and blowing it through her hand onto the wall of the cave. Now, she would have had a basic understanding of her future. She'd have known that the seasons pass. Maybe she even looked forward to coming back to this cave one day. Leaving her mark upon the wall suggests she had started down the road of understanding time and how it stretched out into the future. So what we saw here was this fantastic understanding of how the cave where uh, what we call as human civilization begins, the story of human civilization begins, right? The cave becomes a very critical site for unfolding, unfurling, uh, for uh, uh, understandings to emerge of who we are in this world, okay? Now you must be thinking, what is the relationship of aesthetics to all this? Or maybe not, maybe it's, it's coming to you in intuitive ways. But what we see here is that uh, we're trying to engage not with language yet, okay? We, we're trying to engage with experiences, what it would mean to be in a cave, for example, what it would mean to be outside of a cave, and what it would mean to have this understanding of the transition. Suddenly the cave becomes a home for some person. The cave becomes a cage for some person. The cave becomes somewhere where somebody is imprisoned or somebody walks out of the cave and sees the light of the day, right? So the cave becomes a metaphor for various states of human existence, okay? We'll leave the cave a little bit, we'll come back to it. Now, what I want us to do is focus on a color, okay? And the experience of a color. So since I'm wearing yellow, and I've been in a yellow phase for a long time. I thought yellow would be a great uh, color to focus on. Every one of us knows this is yellow. In Sanskrit, it would be something around, it would be called Pitaha. I think the Sanskrit scholars know better, but I think this is accurate. In Marathi, we would call it Pivra. In Kannada, it is Haldi. In uh, Hindi, we call it Pila, and I'm sure you speak many more tongues and you would know what yellow stands for in your own languages, okay? Now, this is a small exercise I invite all of you to do. So each of you take maybe eight minutes from now. I want each of you to focus on the experience of the color yellow and create a new word for it, okay? So you will be creating a brand new word. Nobody has ever heard of this word before. And that word would stand for the experience of the color yellow, okay? So is that clear for all of you? Would you indulge in this exercise for eight minutes and then we will add these words onto this PPT and make a dictionary for the experience of yellow. How does that sound? Sir. Sounds good? Yes. Okay, so each of you, maybe let's just take five minutes. Okay, I think five minutes should be fine. So it's 3.54 at exactly four o'clock. We'll come back and share. Uh, how many are we in this group? We are like uh, 10 or more than that. We'll each of us 18. Okay. So whoever wants to share, we have to, we can also share 18 words. It will be a very rich new dictionary on yellow, but uh, let's share a dictionary of our new words for this experience, okay? Give me a Zoom reaction that everyone has got this. Give me a Zoom thumbs up. So that I know who's on it and it's begun working.
Okay, great. Faisal also do work on the word. Yeah, yeah. So for those who have, uh, yeah, you can hear me. For those who have already gotten the word, they can already start putting it in the chat. And here's the thing: do not restrict yourself to languages that are typeable. But I know, I mean, for our own constraint reason, we'll have to type it on our keyboard. But uh, you can be innovative. <laughs> okay. Good, we're getting words. It has to be new, okay? Ah, okay, nice. Dla. I don't know how to pronounce that, okay. Ella, okay. Each of you would have to give a short, brief uh, story of why that word for yellow. Liga, okay. Floon, nice, okay. Manji, okay, nice. Hara, hmm. Awesome. So we have like so many new words already. I think I should just uh, take a screenshot of this. Manjol. Ren. Okay. 
So who wants to talk about their work? I mean, I know uh, Pash Pashupu. Okay, <laughs> interesting. They're all very new, definitely very, very new. So uh, who wants to talk about their work? Yeah, sure, go ahead. Uh, I'm not getting a name. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Can I share? Mark. Can I share? Yes, ma'am. Please do. Ma'am, uh, frankly, for me, the color yellow has been a very special because it is not too dark, not too bright, very balanced. For me, it's like a sign of something opening and it's like something when I'm in awe. That's why I wanted to have a very small word and the word that came to me is GLA, GLA. Like some glow is related to glow, something opening up for something better. Okay. That's why that word came to me, GLA. Very nice. I think also the opening is there in that mid break of the word GLA. Right? Where you are opening yes. your mouth also. Yes. It's not a complete yes, and word and it's just like la. Okay. It's like an emotion. I can feel it. And I don't want to say it long because it's a very feeling that I want to absorb. So just la. Gla. Okay. Very nice. Thanks so much. Your name is Kumar or is it S? No, ma'am. My name is Sandeep Kumar Suri. Sandeep, Sandeep okay. Kumar Suri. Yes, All right. Okay. Thanks. Anyone else wants to talk about their work? Uh, Ma'am's uh, uh, very uh, attractive color, shining. Uh, huh. It's like uh, huh. uh, more to uh, shining, attractive and like gold color, golden. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Whenever uh, it is not uh, red or it is not green, it is a uh, middle and a piece also is there. So it is a uh, Bhangra. I told it is Bhangra. Bhangra. Bhangra, because in okay. our Konkani, Konkani language, it is Bhangra means huh. gold. So it's oh, actually Bhangar okay. means gold. Bhangar means gold. But okay. I made mm -hmm. it, I, when I saw it, I felt it Bhangra. So I Bhangra. pronounced okay. it like that. Bhangra, okay. Bhangra. So this is not totally new to you, but you're presenting it as new to those who don't know Konkani. Correct? I actually, it's not in Konkani also. Bhangra is not there. It is a Bhangra. similar word, ha, yeah. Correct. Similar word, but uh, uh, when I saw it, it, it uh, word came to me. That's all. It's not correct. that word okay. is not used. Maybe a similar word is there, but it's not used. Yeah, correct. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. No, no. That, I got it's it. Not totally it's not totally new. It's not totally new. Yeah. Yeah, it is derived and it is derived yes, yes. new. There is yes, yes. Yes. Yes, yes. Yeah. Anyone else wants to talk about? How about uh some very floon? Floon is very interesting. I mean, I could. Who who has yeah, Amruta? That was me. Yes. Uh... I, I wasn't too clever in choosing this. I didn't really think of the roots of the words and um, in different languages for yellow. Uh, but I happen mm -hmm. to go by association here. And since I associate yellow with uh, sunshine and comfort, so comfort makes me go ooh. And uh, I also because it's a cheerful color and I associate that with my pet dog, Lou. And so you have flu there and it had to end somewhere. So I put an end since it's not very abrupt. <laughs> so okay. okay, wonderful. I like the story. I like the story. <laughs> it's a very relational story. You started somewhere, you followed your thoughts, you put something else, you remembered someone, yeah. then you have to end something. So it just like <laughs> comes together into a word. Very yeah, nice. Thank you. Okay, anyone else? Srinivas, Manji. Uh, so, I mean, I was thinking, what can I think of? Uh, yellow is somewhere also one of my, um, uh, not exactly favorite, but the, one of the colors that I like the most. Uh, I thought of something that I can keep it very close to uh, my mother tongue, Tamil. Uh, so, um, Manjal is it in Tamil, but I wanted somewhere it also that it has to have certain kind of sound that it could include or accommodate. Uh, maybe other language uh, phonemes. So I thought of making it sound like Manji. Maybe it could uh, sound little bit similar to North Indian language as well. Mm. At the same time, mm. it could be similar to South Indian, like uh, gets influenced by South Indian language. So it could uh, either way it could help both these uh, 
linguistic gaps and lingual gaps to be bridged so in that sense i thought of this word nice nice it's sort of a, a transformation of uh, both phonetically and linguistically from one to a sort of a family of languages so you alluded to families of languages in a way right and families of sounds the north indian sounds and the south indian sounds right nice thank you so much for indulging this exercise i mean of course all of these words are fantastic and you should keep a track of it for your class uh, to keep your own dictionary i think it becomes an amazing exercise each class creates its own dictionary of experiences and words and that's how you also form a sort of collective identity so that's done with the experience and the conversion of an experience of already known thing into a new thing right so what did we do in this small exercise we converted a known experience we already know yellow colors are something so primary we are born with an understanding of these primary qualities or colors right and we already know what we uh, this thing that is yellow but then we also have different experiences that are our own that we attach to this quality or property called yellow and in for some it would be a color for some it would be a wavelength for some it would be a pigment for some it would be matter for some it would be light correct but all of it is yellow and what we did by putting this new word in relation to this experience is we renewed it we refreshed it we extended the experience we made available the same universal experience of yellow as a color and made it available in many many different ways so it's sort of a kaleidoscopic uh, multiplication of the experience that was otherwise previously only singular right so having talked about that we will now proceed to talk about i call it the radio station call experience okay and experience and knowledge are like two very big very happening hep radio stations of a philosophy okay if it of philosophy is a radio tower you have experience as one radio station you have knowledge as another radio station and we constantly keep tuning in to one or the other sometimes both overlap and that is a different uh, totally different kind of uh, uh, listening experience but when we are trying to understand what this thing called experience is which you will of course by the end of your course get to know and you may be able to tell me better than myself we talk about aesthetics and aesthetics for example uh, aesthetics come from aesthetics aesthetics is the root uh, from the greek aesthetics which is very simply something that can be called a grasping of the world through our senses right so what comes when you talk about aesthetics anesthesia you are surrounded by kmc there in manipal and you know very well anesthetics are delivered or are given to people to numb their senses right but when we're talking about aesthetics we are talking about the opposite there is there is an invigoration there is a acknowledgement of senses and uh, the understanding of how our experiences come to us through our senses right so but what happens is that in the western canons or in the greco european traditions aesthetics has a very particular uh, history it's a very interesting very beautiful history of course where we have aesthetics having a rational history baumgarten talks about aesthetics then we have kant talking about aesthetics as a synthesis uh synthetic ground where reason and senses come together and so on and so forth okay and then it is taken on forward in various different ways and in the modern times we have something called soma aesthetics or soma aesthetics would be aesthetics that is connected to the body somatic practices and aesthetics are connected so they talk about it as a new kind of aesthetics okay on the other hand though if you look at traditions in south asia in global south because our interest in the subject and the object is very blurred our understanding of uh, the world around us does not come in very clean and neat cut experience versus knowledge silos they are intertwined right so we have a very phenomenologically rich uh, heritage 
which means that a lot of uh, emphasis is given on embodiment, the body as becoming a key player in how experiences come to us and the body and therefore the key role of perception in our understanding of our experiences, right? So phenomenology, which is that part of philosophy where we try to understand how we experience any kind of experience as embodied subjects, right? That then becomes our larger umbrella through which we may try to understand what aesthetics can do to our world, right? So we have, uh, we try to understand how aesthetics has a, a slightly different kind of interest when it comes to the European tradition. But then we also know where the focus of aesthetics on the embodied subject is more in the non in the global south or the south asian traditions right now you may say that all of us as human beings have five senses maybe six maybe seven as many as you want but that means that aesthetics should be a universal uh, understanding of what uh, how we grasp the world right so that is where the fun starts the understanding of how maybe your experience and my experience of the same thing, which is like the color yellow, is maybe two so different things. But then there are some commonalities. There are some specificities, right? So we talk about aesthetics then in relation to cultures, particularities, specificities, uh, you know, context. As well, as well as the possibility of universal feelings and emotions, which is what your entire uh, Rasa theory is all about, okay? And let's just indulge again now in a very uh, fascinating small parable. And all of you may already have heard or may not have heard, and that's okay, of Plato. He is a Greek philosopher, the, the student of Socrates. And Plato's allegory of the cave is a very well understood, very well discussed uh, allegory where we come back to the cave, okay? Now let us look at how Plato looks at the cave, okay? And then connect to our previous entry into the cave of Vimbeka and the other caves and just try to understand what is happening in this video, okay? in a parable to what ex let me show in a parable to what extent our nature is enlightened or unenlightened envision human figures living in an underground cave with a long entrance across the whole width of the cave here they have been from their childhood and have their legs and necks chained so that they cannot move and can only see before them, being prevented by the chains from turning their heads around. Above and behind them, a fire is blazing at a distance. They see only their own shadows, which the fire throws on the opposite wall of the cave. For how could they see anything but the shadows if they were never allowed to move their heads? Between the fire and the prisoners, there is a raised way and a low wall built along the way like the screen which puppet players have in front of them over which they show the puppets. Do you see men passing along the wall carrying all sorts of articles which they hold projected above the wall? Statues of men and animals made of wood and stone and very materials of the objects which are being carried in like manner they would only see the shadows and if they were able to converse with one another suppose that they were naming what was actually before them
And suppose further that there was an echo which came from the wall. Would they not be sure to think when one of the passers-by spoke that the voice came from the passing shadows? To them, the truth would be literally nothing but the shadows of the images. And now look again and see what will naturally follow if one of the prisoners is released. At first, when he is liberated and compelled suddenly to stand up and turn his head round and look towards the light, all this would hurt him and he would be much too dazzled to see distinctly those things whose shadows he had seen before. Someone saying to him that what he saw before but that now when he's approaching nearer to reality and his eyes he has a clearer vision what will be his reply to the objects as they pass and requiring him to name not be perplexed? Will he not think that the shadows which he formerly saw are truer than the objects which are now shown to him? And suppose once more that he is reluctantly dragged into the presence of When he approaches the light, his eyes will be dead. But he will not be able to see anything at all of what a novel is. He will require to grow accustomed to the sight of the upper world. And first he will see the shadows best. Next the reflections of objects in the water. And then the objects themselves. Then he will gaze upon the stars and the spangled heavens and the light of the moon. He will see the sky and the stars by night. Last of all, he will be able to see the sun. And not mere reflections of it in the water, but he will see the sun in its own proper place and not in another. And he will contemplate the sun as it is. Imagine, once more, such a one coming suddenly out of the sun to be replaced in his old situation. Would he not be certain to have his eyes full of darkness? And if there were a contest of measuring the shadows and he had to compete with the prisoners who had never moved out of the den, while his sight was still weak and before his eyes had become steady, wouldn't they all laugh at him and say he had spoiled his eyesight by going up there? And that it was better not to even think of ascending? <laughs> and if anyone tried to release another and lead him up to the light, let them only catch the offender. Right. And they would put him to death. Has anyone of you? Oh, okay, wait one minute. Just stop. Have any of you already know, uh, known of Plato's Parable of the Cave? Were you aware? You can just use your Zoom reactions to tell. No, okay, this is good. Yes. So, ah, Sharat was aware, okay, very good. So, what were we looking at now that we looked at the cave as a very different location? The cave as a place of, uh, according to Plato, it's a site of like mega transformation, right? When someone is, when these people who were looking at the shadows and thinking that the shadows were the real thing, and one of them is liberated and goes out and actually looks at the thing in itself or the real thing, of who, uh, you know, uh, which was very different from the nature of reality they were open to be before. And 
this is what i think according to plato it's calling it's it's about this transition towards being quote unquote enlightened right but we definitely are looking at a shift in understanding something understanding the nature of the world because there is an encounter there is a change in how and what has been experienced by the person right so the significance of lived experiences for example is something that we can take and we require lived experiences to have any kind of hope or for any kind of progress for knowledge to happen right so unless we move unless we change our locations unless we put ourselves in different situations and encounter something that maybe we had never encountered before maybe it's a work of art maybe it's the uh, it's trekking on mount everest or maybe it's you know just trying to uh, meditate for the first time right a new kind of experience what it does is it enables or makes ground for knowledge to progress and so there is also the signification of imagination and how our uh, psychological faculties are also deeply entwined and informing uh, informing the way in which these experiences come to us right and the last one is the significance of various kinds of perception that help us understand the world right so in this particular allegory for example you have the first kind of perception which is equally valid one may argue as you have the second kind so the first they are looking at shadows and trying to understand or think that that is what it is they are amazing at it the second they are looking at the world uh, the person is looking at the world in a very different light and that is a different kind of perception right there are two different kinds of perception and for example if you go deeper you will have these very different ways of perceiving the world the savikalpanik the nirvikalpanik the discerning the non discerning and there are various levels it's a fascinating uh, uh, field of uh, understanding how we perceive the world especially in indian philosophy so generally we are looking at aesthetics as a discipline or as an inquiry uh, as an antenna that is committed to the world of experiences and i think minal may talk about abhinav gupta and his contribution to uh, aesthetics at large in the indian context and that's what it is he, you know the hall of mirrors for example is a classic example that you may uh, talk about and aesthetic theories therefore have emerged as various theories that try to make sense of our world of experience okay and here i have put these two big words immanence and transcendence i don't know maybe maybe some of you may be able to make sense of it but uh, you know they can be tried they can be understood as lived experience and experience that is uh, possible beyond the lived experience so uh, we can talk about the immanent as something that belongs to this world it is available to our experiential self in a very tangible palpable way something that is around our inherent and in things that we can experience uh laukika is one way of trying to understand it and tra- transcendent is something that is as simple as you just talk about the beyond right something that tries to go beyond and tries to uh, look at how something can be more than what it is or something that is trying to aspire to some state of being common being general being universal right and or the other words it can be called alaukik or otherworldly or you know i mean i think the ex- experts here should put more light on the you know linguistic specificities of it but very roughly what we are trying to see is this uh these are the two uh, you know nodes between which various degrees or various distances are reached and aesthetic theories try to make sense of the world either in a very imminent heavy way or a transcendental way and uh, they look at our experiences on this meter of uh, experiences okay which is which could be the worldly or the other world okay and here i i always find the example of a uh, plant very interesting as this metaphor right uh, 
I, I, this is a hibiscus flower and this is a replacement of tulip that Khan talks about. Uh, so maybe in our context, we can talk about the hibiscus, which is more uh, prevalent. And the flower that grows from the earth and what is it? Where does it belong? Is it transcendent? Is it worldly? Is it otherworldly? Right? And how, if it is worldly, how does it become otherworldly? Right? And because in aesthetics, for example, the first, uh, the common parlance translation of aesthetics, we would say is Saundarya Shastra. But then that is, I think, uh, that needs to be revisited. But the understanding of what is beauty or beautiful, for example, is one part of it. And where is beauty uh, located on this meter is whatever is beautiful tries to take the worldly and puts it into a little bit of a transcendental mode. Okay, so it tries to push it towards a transcendent. So, and uh, each of these experiences will have at least these four characteristics. There'll be some kind of an essence. There'll be some kind of relationality. And there will be an understanding of some specificity or particularity and some kind of universality in these experiences, as well as attitudinal, right? So aesthetic, an aesthetic object, for example, could be purely an, uh, based on an attitude. With what, what does that mean? That means that the object that we call as an aesthetic object is dependent on our attitude towards it. And uh, a lot of modern and postmodern theories take up this attitudinal way where anything can turn into an aesthetic object and it need not have anything inherent in the object itself to make it an aesthetic object, okay? So I'm just going to like, you know, share some works, for example, to try to understand what you see so uh, can we have some responses based on the light of what I just discussed? Uh, what do you see in these works that could be essential, for example, or that could be universal, that could be attitudinal? I think this is quite, this is a painting by Enna Fusen, but there are other elements that we can maybe trace. Anybody is able to uh, trace these elements? You can maybe raise your hand or just unmute yourself. What are you seeing in this work? Arjun? Yeah. Uh, I can read the I'm not able to hear you. Uh, maybe Sandeep can speak. Uh, yeah, please unmute. No, not completely. Or you so, can type it in the chat. Sandeep, we can't able to hear you. So am I audible now? Yeah. yeah. You can type it in the chat also. Okay. Uh, I raised the hand just to uh, say that I observe that a woman is taking care of his, uh, taking care of a family. Um, there's a kid, there's a man uh, sleeping on a cock, nothing. Uh, maybe he's not doing anything and uh, she's trying to do her best. She's taking care of him also. Or maybe he's uh, sick. That is also a possible. And the kid uh, to uh, our left, it is on its own. I think it's uh, playing or when some, I mean, that that's what the first impression uh, of this image, which I get. Yeah, good. Now that's the thing. That's the fun part of it. You have already captured a lot uh, without catching yourself capturing it. Now the, the, the task is now to try to understand how you inferred that uh, there is a man and there are these women. Uh, because the... I mean, and what is this taking care? How do you infer that it is... She is... Um, she's there is a taking care element. Yeah, he's uh, sorry. She is touching 
her uh, i mean she is touching his hand maybe she is applying something or she is trying to wake him up she is trying to uh, tell him that uh, she needs her help and the color particularly the brown or the dark brown color it immediately um, comes to my mind it's uh, a rock solid rock it, it kind of mountain oh, okay. color or something like that. so and, and he is maybe he is sick that's why he, he is not able to move or maybe he is lazy mm-hmm. he is not taking any i mean he is not ready to take any responsibility so and but she is right. trying to uh, make him uh, uh, aware of that necessity or maybe she is trying her best to do uh, i mean that that's what indicating and okay there is a hand in no, between no very fantastic i think uh, yeah correct mm. yeah and maybe uh, uh, i assume uh, some some like in the stories there will be an ashrira vani or something like that right so now someone is saying so no no need to do uh, such thing you you can uh, you are capable to uh, do on your own or some some uh, message is trying to say no don't try to do something uh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, no, Whatever very interesting. Thank mind, you. Just, uh... Thanks, thanks, thanks for sharing. Really, no, because that is what is what happens when we look at something. We already imbibe a lot of quote unquote data, sense data, information, and uh, all this information is already informing how we are inferring or are trying to understand what we are looking at, and why we are able to infer in a way that it connects. exactly and now sandeep uh, observed that the who the their sari borders have a particular symbolic quality right it is related to mother teresa and uh, mother teresa's and followers of mother teresa's uh, uh, cause they would wear these sarees and they are also connected with taking care of people and maybe their body gestures moving towards it. Uh, so the body language is also telling you a lot of information about what is happening and many roles uh, da, 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 correct so the mother teresa symbol for example so we have the universal qualities of you recognizing these are human beings you have very particular qualities like the border of the sari which tells you that this is mother teresa's uh is is a symbolic representation perhaps of mother teresa you have an attitudinal quality is what now uh, i think when arjuna talked about uh, the asharira vani that is his attitude his extra uh, his interpretation that makes it a completely different uh, i would not have thought about it and he talked about it and so now i can start seeing it in the picture right and then we have our uh, essential qualities essential would be again what is essential here uh, we see the essence of human beings there one is uh, being taken there is an essential quality of speciality one is horizontal these people are sitting we can also identify maybe different age groups because of our knowledge of certain kinds of essences the a baby is always small the essence of the baby is that it cannot be a big baby essence of a big body is that it will be a uh, adult essence of a younger person is that you know it, they will take up a particular way of being depicted right so uh, faisal you wanted to say something so uh, the one thing interesting observation um, I, i felt was uh, the major character mother teresa or like the woman uh, invisible i mean it's not finely made so uh, this thing these characters are invisible and whereas uh, they are the major uh, essentially yes correct and uh, there are they are disembodied almost they are just there as uh, you know they haven't been defined but they are already self uh, they're speaking for themselves atanima uh, yeah um uh just a second i just took a minute to unmute myself and uh, yeah so um uh, i remember as a student um uh, looking at this painting in ngma and i remember at that point too and it's such a deja vu that i thought that i'll probably speak about this some day that i was very um uh, i was i was somehow stuck with this figure 
of this queer figure um, wearing a sort of green colored uh, loin cloth maybe but at the same time it's usually the men who wear loin cloth and um, and this and here this figure has i don't know if whether to call them a male or female or do or apply any sort of gender categories to them so mm. i i was i found it so difficult to categorize this figure you know the moment uh, you know all of us shared our observations one or the other person is saying this is a woman this is a man this is a child you know we are categorizing mm. in the most assured and definite way possible but when when i look at this figure i find it so difficult to categorize this figure i is that bosom or chest uh, heavier than other yeah. so is that a woman mm. but then why is not covered because for most other people it's covered right it's it's just and she she or he they have tied their hair in a bun so is it a man woman again the same question for me i mean it defies all categorization that figure for me it that yes, was the piece definitely of, thanks thanks so much and exactly what asanima pointed out what these sm- things that come to us when we catch ourselves talking about something and then we catch ourselves not being able to make sense of it we are already moving uh, categories we are moving between categories so you talked about categories is a very big part of your metaphysical and epistemological education is trying to understand categories and they are informed by these uh you know universalities particularities relationalities and so on okay and so we have so many of these and if we had more time we would dwell a little more but i'll just show you because they have a very beautiful sort of it, they make sense without having a particular kind of language barrier they speak across languages okay i mean uh for this you may have to have the literacy of uh, english alphabet but that's that's one constraint but for here this is it's a concrete poem by eugene gomringer called silence okay and uh, eugene gomringer always worked with letters and he tried to make poems from them but the poems were also sonorous they were almost like they had a sonic quality to it so there it is now we are looking at synesthesia for example different senses being available to you through one kind of an expression okay and so you can see this this is not a written text per se this is not an image totally because it has word it is an image text com- combination it is also talking about silence and silence is uh, the manifestation of the absence of sound the 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 central gap is surrounded by the words all right so it is so beautiful in itself you can talk about it for hours this one particular image poem right um and then we have the most available images for especially in certain cultural uh, context we must all have encountered an image of something like this in our lives or in our grandmothers places or in museums this is uh, saraswati but it is an oleographic print that tra- came out of raja ravi verma's printing press and we they made so many copies of it then right now we can immediately grasp it as a saraswati direct identification okay but for someone who wouldn't have these categories uh, maybe they see something more now here the task is this that we have to work so hard to try to see newly and refresh the same image that we are so used to right and i think when we talk about aesthesis or grasping something through our senses we also are very aware of how we are jumping some steps and directly arriving at conclusion so the various steps for example before we infer or come to a conclusion is a training that you are more open to when we try to understand the world of experiences and the steps in it okay and so here of course we have another painting by van gogh and we're also of course when you're looking at all these different works uh, these are art works they can be aesthetic objects uh, because they're defined as aesthetic objects they're available to us right uh, but here we are able to recognize this as a landscape so there is some kind of relation there's some kind of to and fro between the real world and uh, taking it from the real world making it something else something new and this new is as real maybe quote and quote more more than real right 
and uh, something what Shulman would talk about. And we have, of course, then poetry. And there's a lot, uh, so especially in Sanskrit aesthetics and, uh, you know, poesis and poetics play a very important role. And this is because language is deeply connected to our experiences. That's why we began with the whole exercise of making a new word, right? And uh, Sangam literature and the history of Sangam literature is very well known and widely studied because of its correlation between landscapes, emotions, feelings, and its capturing in poetry. And so each poem, for example, alludes to a certain state of mind, a frame of mind has an undertone of a particular mode or emotion. Uh, this is, uh, you know, this is the landscape genre of Kurun Tokai. And uh, Ike Ramanujam has translated a lot of uh, Sangam poetry. Uh, there's this collection called Interior Landscape, which is very nice. So this is an example of a uh, kind of psychogeography, right? You're, yourself are connected to the world. You are, you're not distanced from the world. It is also an example of how experience and knowledge are coming together. You are not divorced from your environment. You're part of this, what we call ecology, okay? And uh, again, another one uh, by Arjun Gombrenga called Wind. I love this. It's like, you know, it's wind, it's the word, it's the experience of the word, it's an image, he's playing with it. But there are a lot of uh, elements. And this again will help you try to understand this whole world of Dhwani or resonance that we call, right? Uh, and, uh, uh, you know, in Dhvanya Loka, uh, you will talk about this whole notion of how you resonate with something. And resonance is a very different way of connecting to uh, something where there is no obligation to meaning making. And it is all about you experiencing that thing before you try to make meaning out of it, right? Meaning is already implicit. Okay. So, so we're talking about, therefore, this, when we looked at all these works, right? We are looking at something. We are also existing in relation to that something. And then we're trying to make sense of it. So this, here we have a seashell. The seashell could be an image for one person, could be a tool for another person, an artwork for the third. It could be a sample, so like a scientific uh, sample for another person, right? So when that same thing is different things for different people, we have a relation between the object and the subject. Each subject is different. And then together, when we're trying to understand this experience, we then push it towards an, a state of intersubjectivity. So when this person who talks about this as an image talks to the next person who thinks about that object as a tool, there is a new kind of shared experience that is created, right? And so objects become activation sites for relationality to happen. And what is happening here is that when uh, this particular seashell is now uh, occasion for an aesthesis to happen for each of these, a process of translation is taking place. A process of poesis is taking place, okay? And poesis, you translate poesis as to make something, something in the making or something is created. And that is where poesia or poesis can be traced to, okay? So something is made and something is translated. It is again this play between the worldly and the otherworldly, the imminent and the transcendent, right? Of this world experiential, then beyond this experience and so on. And uh, here I thought I'll play this a little bit of this is a very fun translation project, I feel. It's a transcreation. I don't know, maybe some of you have already heard this. It was, you know, going viral at some point. It is Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, and it has been translated into uh, a visual uh, image. I don't know what you call it. it. It has been translated. That's it. I will think I'll call it that. So I'll, I'll play a little bit of this so you can get a sense of how it goes. Thank you. 
I mean, this goes on. It's fascinating to just keep looking at it. I'm sure maybe some of did has any of you one of you seen this before? Yeah, someone saw it. Okay, good. Arjun saw it. So, uh, what were we looking at here? The, uh, when you listen to the music, we are not listening anymore. We were also watching the music. We were experiencing the music in a very eventful manner, right? So it became an event, the so-called piece of music that we tag or call as an object turned into an experiential event, right? And for those of us who then try to look at aesthetics in a more uh, specified manner, in a more deeper manner, we move beyond just trying to recognize events and you know, uh, relying on easy cues. And we go into specificities. We try to go one step in. We try to be more sensitive, more attuned to what we are experiencing, right? So therefore, we can see that aesthetics can act like a, what I would call a phenomenological technology for some kind of a Venus to emerge, right? Because we are not just encountering or engaging with a thing there. We're engaging with the experience for possible for that thing in relation to all other people. There is, there are, in the encounter between something and yourself, you recognize you exist and something else outside of you exists, right? So there is more than oneness often uh, when, and even when you're recognizing yourself, there is a doubleness, I would say. It is never a singularity. There is always a more than oneness when you look even at yourself. Because when you're looking at the mirror, you're looking at an image of you, it's two. You need that two-ness, at least more than oneness, I would say. So that's what I call the Venus. This is multiplication. You are in then uh, aware of yourself as a relational being. And I like this image. Uh, it's a portrait of uh, Shivram Karan, the polyglot who uh, you know lived, worked in, uh, the same Dakshin Kanda region, uh, he, he lives such a rich and immense life. And uh, you know, you'll see some of his younger time portraits in the Hebar galleries. This is a portrait of Shivram Karan by K.K. Hebar. And it is also the use for his uh, bio autobiography, so where you have Look at him, it's not just one person. It's also showing movement. You may interpret it as movement, but it may also show a person with four heads and three hands. What are we remembering or thinking of our various kinds of mythical gods and goddesses with all these different kinds of uh, physiological quirks, right? Very clear, very funny, very interesting and intriguing and very, uh, you know, fun. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's sort of a carnivalist celebration of trying to understand the self and the various possibilities of Venus, right? And as a technology, a phenomenological technology, if you call it, we see it operating in different ways. For example, we can look at the Ragamala painting tradition in the Indian miniature painting tradition. And here you see, you usually will focus on very well-known universal tropes of you know, Krishna, Radha, mythology, iconography, everything where you recognize what's happening, you recognize the event, you recognize, you see that person, it's Krishna, there's a Radha, and they try to evoke a certain emotion connected to a rag. And rag is basically a systematized codification of a particular kind of uh, musical atmosphere, right? So here we have Megh Rag, dedicated to the time of the monsoons, and the Meghrag is associated with an emotion, the Shringara Rasa, okay? And that is where the Rasa theory will. So you have the correlation of season, of a, ment of a personal emotion, of a particular kind of music that is coming out of this, and that emerging into a certain universalizable emotion or Rasa that could be the Shringara Rasa. So, the confidence of the rasa theorists is that if you play this and this, you know, most likely you will get a certain kind of rasa. And that rasa we have captured and we have codified and we have like nine rasas or maybe more you can add to it in the digital age, right? On the other hand, we have someone like the abstractionist called Mark Rothko. And 
because we began with yellow i thought we should also look at, back at him using yellow and his paintings were this they were vast they were huge they were abstract and he spent they were systematic systematic uh, blotches of color trying to evoke certain responses and reflect his state of mind right and this was the also the tradition of abstractionism where we try to you know uh, for example hussein was an abstractionist but the modern abstractness in india here this one uh, stayed in uh, new york but they were also the product of the world war the post world war depression and then the abstractionism emerged then to kind of uh, respond emotionally creatively to this larger cultural moment right so uh, the venuses emerge in various ways i would say and so that's where i come to the last the sort of the crux of this is what does it mean then so the concept of saharadaya is something that you will encounter when we talk about aesthetics poesis poetics experience also uh, and it is a fascinating contribution uh, from uh, you know, indian philosophical traditions to the whole field of aesthetics and uh, what is a saharadaya what does it mean to be a saharadaya okay saharadaya co heart i don't know what it not even a co heart a co soul uh, you know a cohabitant of the heart uh, region if you may call it okay uh, but i could also see a sort of semblance we could talk about friendship in the same terms we could talk about solidarity allyship uh, we could talk about um, uh, collegiality uh, affection uh you know a sense of uh, togetherness you know a sense of community uh, all through this concept of saharadaya and how then what would it mean to be the saharadaya of things of as uh, simple things as flowers maybe a saharadaya of a forest of cells of beings right and so this uh, these are excerpts from papers but you will definitely read more manal can also talk to you about it abhinav gupta describes or defines saharadaya as a very particular kind of a persona who you know engages with works of art so another word that emerges in this entire thing is the rasika for example so who has been exposed to the work who knows how to resonate with it he's also reflecting the experiences that the quote and quote aesthetic object or a work is trying to convey right now i wouldn't limit saradaya as a concept only for the arts but it is a concept that helps us negotiate life and that's why i like uh, this particular text by celine condrady she's a european artist and she and because a lot of european philosophers talk about friendship and in this uh, notes of friendship for example uh the quote from bertrand russell is uh, mentioned where you say the main things which seem to me important on their own account and not merely as means to other things are knowledge art instinctive happiness and relations of friendship and affection and then uh, another part he talks about philosophy itself as a field of friendship because it has the word philia in it right so while philosophy is the field in which friendship appears as a subject uh it also holds the word friend in its very name so the two are intimately and inextricably connected and of course in the other part she talks about how it is very fundamental to talk about uh, a, a condition for doing things together and for example learning together in this particular digital <laughs> digital uh, togetherness we are uh, trying to achieve a certain kind of saharadaya okay we're trying to uh, achieve a certain kind of togetherness and identity that is and this is not me here this is me in relation to all of you and ranima fazal and that's why sometimes it's often very very critical that we have faces to mirror each other so in my classes for example i always request those who can switch on their videos to switch it on because we become mirrors we are then equal category in terms of exchanging uh, you know notes and sharing because we're also giving you body language information we're giving you an embodied uh, sense data 
and it is not just one way, right? So I think as students, for example, there is a deep commitment to the classroom as a space for creating this uh, collegial, this uh, philosophy and education actually come together in a very nice way. And so keep these in mind when you talk about, uh, you know, uh, philosophy, uh, when you are you stepping into philosophy as an education uh, in your master's level, it becomes an atmosphere. It, it becomes an atmosphere for translating experiences through language. Uh, and language is more and more critical, especially when you're talking about doing philosophy in the global South, in South Asian traditions, uh, because we are so multilingual inherently, our multilinguality informs our experiences in much more richer ways. And that doesn't mean we dismiss our uh, acquired universal languages, like English, for example, enables us to communicate universally, and that is great. Now, but then I am also interested in the Hinglish and then the Tanglish and the Kinglish and the Kanglish and all those. We are making it our own, and that is beautiful in itself. That is enriching it, furthering knowledge. And so language becomes then the atmosphere for this Venus, right? So you will definitely, if you have a different language to switch into, you definitely feel more friendly. You feel more at ease. You feel more comfortable, right? And so we have to do philosophy across languages. That's why it's, I mean, speaking about Sanskrit as a base and it's not just Sanskrit, Sanskrit, Pali, Kannada, regional languages. Philosophy is done in all these languages. Right? So you have to question and try to look, engage with the language as that atmosphere where you can try to understand yourself and what you're trying to do with that community. And this Venus then becomes the atmosphere for understanding uh, the biggest questions that philosophy puts for us, right? Uh, the question of existence, the question of meanings, purposes, uh, why we exist, what we exist for, what do we do, how, how do we make sense of our existence and so on and so forth, right? So I will stop because I already exceeded. I had two more videos to show you, but uh, I mean, I can always share the links and you can see it at your uh, ease and in your time. Uh, I can share it to Utsan Iman, she can share it with you. But questions, reflections are most welcome. Thank you so much for indulging and listening to me for so long. Thank you so much for that. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it was an experience. And sometimes it's <laughs> sort of, and I don't think that we have had anything like this in the immersion program, which, you know, brings out the creative being in us and um, helps us think creatively. So thank you so much for actually making this a creative space. Uh, yeah, so I think if there are any questions from the participants, from our students, colleagues, there are any questions, you know, specific to the study of aesthetics, even if it's conceptual or theoretical, you can also ask that, or you would like to ask something related to your experience of art, um, please go ahead. Any observations as well? I'm sure Shrazna would be very happy to receive any observations, any takeaways from this um, session. Anything anyone would like to say and share? Any questions, queries? No, am I audible, ma'am? No. Yes, yeah, yes. please I... go ahead. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Uh, actually, uh you we haven't had any uh reading material to read before coming to you so i was just very curious uh what would be the honorable guest going to tell us today and let's like the background etc then i came upon uh, an article uh if it was about you and it was when you are going to join the your uh, uh, Korea University, if I'm spelling right, K-R-E-A, where you are right. So you are going to join that and uh, there is an... Uh, Korea, yeah. Uh, yes, there is an article from uh, Inlux Shivdasani Foundation. There is an article in there. Mm -hmm. And that article, uh, what I like to focus is, you were focusing on uh, how you uh, want to do with uh, philosophy and interweaving it with the uh, 
other sciences art social science and uh, humanities this was your objective so i'm just very curious uh, uh, while you have tried that while being in that university what had been your expectation before doing that and what did you achieve by that and what more you want to have from that that it has not been achieved that uh, noble thought that you had of interweaving philosophy with so many different uh, uh, aspects of other branches. So how has been your experience? I just want to, I'm very curious about that. Thank you so much for your question, for also going, taking the effort to go and read it. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, definitely very interested in interdisciplinarity. It's something that I inherit from Manipal Center for Humanities. So Tanima can also vouch for it that interdisciplinarity is the future of everything, I think, because uh, uh, what does interdisciplinarity promise us? It's a certain kind of a possibility of a universal way of communicating. When I'm talking something uh, to another person, they can be from two different disciplines if they want to uh, you know, align towards that. But then there is a conversation possible. It's not like everyone is putting silos and doing their thing and just running some kind of a very isolated uh, rat race in this so-called world. But there are you know, new conversations possible between people, between interests. Concepts can move across sociology, mathematics, sciences, physics, for example. You know, metaphysics and physics, they have the word common there. So you have to try to think, what is that? Why is that commonality? What There should be something to that, right? And so you would know, I don't know if you already know, but then the sciences emerged as philosophy of natural sciences. So Newton was called a philosopher of, uh, a natural philosopher, sorry, not philosophy of nature. Uh, he was a natural philosopher before they started calling him a scientist. The science as a discipline emerges during a particular moment in history. And before that, they were all philosophers. You have Thales talking about the world full of water, or you know, you have all these philosophers walking around trying to make sense of the world. And then one set of them try to make sense of the world through realism and what exists outside, independent of our perception. They became the scientists. Those who try to make sense of the world completely dependent on us perhaps became the psychologists. Those who try to make sense of the world as we make it, perhaps became the artists. They all, so philosophy is actually like the grandmother discipline. And what we do now is when we try to engage with philosophy as a discipline, we cannot forget that it, it is related to all these other disciplines because philosophical questions you have to make it equally relevant in today's time to speak back to it, to be updated and talk to these disciplines and how they use these words. For example, if you're engaging with the concept of Saharadeya, it is belonging or it emerged from your, you know, from the theatrical, the performative arts. It talks about the audience and engaging with the dramaturgy and the collective feeling of the audience when they look at the theater. But do you not think that this is applicable to your cinema viewing experience? Or do you not think that this could be applicable in a different way to your classroom experience? Any per experience where there is that same conditions replayed, right? So that is the only way in which you will be able to further knowledge. Otherwise, you would be the people looking at the illusions in the caves or shadows and thinking that is the real thing. I mean, the pro Progress happens when you break you, the paradigm, move that paradigm. It matters. It matters not to the historians, not to the time in the, uh, in the back, uh, you know, that is past already, but it matters because we can maybe contribute to a way of looking at the world very newly or in a refreshed manner. It matters because maybe you find some community, uh, you know, feeling of community there. But it cannot uh, turn into a relic object that you is you just like you know talk about it and then you leave it there and you go there and then you do your thing and there is no relation to it. So interdisciplinarity is actually very intuitively close to how we live in this world, right? We don't 
uh, when we drink water, we reach out for the glass. We drink water. We don't talk about H two O. We don't, you know, talk about our hand as a body. I mean, we just reach out and drink water. So that 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 is the practical aspect of it. So, and when we try to dissect it, it is deeply interdisciplinary. So the phenomenology of a chemistry, a chemical ingestion of a uh, biological phenomenon of thirst causing it, and so you can actually give. It's fun. But uh, I would say interdisciplinarity is very natural to us. It comes naturally, so it's inevitable that it actually takes a lot of hard work to become super disciplinary and super isolated. I am sometimes it's just exhausting. It's nicer. It's more freer. You get more energy when you're uh, engaging with other disciplines. I would say. So I mean, there's a lot of work to do. So I wouldn't be able to answer that. If you just begun, I'm also a student. I would definitely. Consider myself as always learning uh, student. So uh, there's so much work to do that I mean nothing is done yet. I think programs such as these should take that up. You should do it. Tell me how you're uh, faring in some time. Thank you, ma'am. Thanks. Good luck with the program. Um, just when we started with this orientation immersion program, the first uh, lecture that we organized was with uh, Dr. Vivek De Devroy, and it was about uh, multidisciplinarity and um, this discussion about, you know, transcending these disciplinary boundaries has been ongoing since then. And I see, and I see, I'm sure my colleagues and students as well would agree that multidisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity, they're so integral to any form of philosophical thinking as well. Because what is philosophy all about, if not for intellectual openness for that matter? So I think uh, there's something to really look up to if there are, you know, um, young aspirants in the field of philosophy who are just transcending or doing philosophy in the most transdisciplinary way. So, yeah, so any other questions from the participants? I see mm. there are a few other students. Yes, Ananda, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you for your thoughtful uh, session. Um, uh, maybe it will be a basic question. I'm sorry for that. Uh, but I'm very new for uh, these uh, all areas, so I'm asking this question. Um, in in philosophy, uh, in uh, I think in axiology, uh, it it is divided uh, ethics and uh, uh, aesthetics. Uh, but I didn't understand uh, how it is related to philosophy. How they put this. Uh, area in that uh, axiology aesthetics how it, it is connected to philosophy uh, can you say something okay sure sure i mean so very yes, sir, 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 just yes. to, just to add this uh, to what uh, uh, ananda uh, dr ananda tirtha was trying to point out is that this is one uh, interesting debate i don't know whether it, uh, it's not such a prominent debate so maybe we might uh, miss this debate, but in Indian philosophy, mm, uh, what happens is that uh, though yoga is part of this uh, philosophical schools, uh, traditionally speaking, like uh, when they are discussing about, uh, there is some concept called Vidyasthana, uh, knowledge domain. So in that knowledge domain, uh, some of these schools are, they take place as an independent thought or as a subsidiary uh, knowledge domain, like uh, as a subcategory of knowledge domains. In, in either way, that's aesthetics or uh, there is a huge debate whether it should be called as Alankara Shastra or Rasa Shastra. Because if it is called as Alankara Shastra, then Rasa people and then Dwani uh, people and then Riti people will feel offended. If it is called Rasa people, then the other uh, Rasa Shastra, it is called others feel offended. Whatever it is, in Kavya or uh, Sahitya or Alankara Shastra is not primarily concerned with the term Darshana. So, uh, and uh, mostly in, uh, mostly in uh, Sanskrit traditions, 
the placing aesthetics in a philosophical domain is something i wouldn't say unexplored because there is abhinava gupta and there are a lot of other people like jagannatha and uh, uh, vishwanatha and so on but despite that there is a concern whether aesthetics still configures in philosophical discussion as an independent philosophical school of thought so so in that sense i mean it, i'm just adding these points so that you could elaborate your perspective on this as well thank you thank you i think that actually enriches the discussion and i'm sure you will and and you know indulge in this in your course coursework as the classes begin but a very lightly pointed out i did not use that categorization to begin with i placed as thesis as a process i did not say aesthetics if you were uh alert to that i just said aesthetics and then when i'm saying aesthetics it's a process right something where you're looking at aesthetics across domains and aesthetics as part of a phenomenologically driven inquiry right and yes phenomenology is always i don't know it's like this new child or the much later born or i don't know why so we do have talk about merleau ponty and these people from the french embodiment tradition but it's uh, the talking about the embodied subject and when you're looking at uh, the philosophy of yoga philosophy of samkhya embodiment is a sort of a big foundational uh, presupposition before you get into uh, trying to understand uh, the metaphysics so we are interested in the experience in uh, con- concerned with our uh, self as being embodied subject experience in the world and that's where i try to look at aesthetics uh, as helping us make sense of our phenomenological rich traditions in the south asian uh, you know especially maybe in the uh, the sanskritic traditions uh, i ch- i was uh, trying to try to learn, tell talk about or learn a little more on the sufi traditions Sufi is also very interested in uh, the body and the transcendence of the body, but not so much in uh, 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 the other uh, thing, the Islamic or Arabic traditions or, or Arabic metaphysics, where uh, they give a lot of importance to aql and rationality and reason. Uh, they they have a very different. I think that connects to Aristotle, right? Aquinas as well. It goes there. So, in terms of traveling of ideas across geography, so. when you read in a textbook quote and quote where okay aesthetics falls under axiology the theory of values and then the theory of values then of ethics and, and uh, aesthetics as the discipline i would say at your level we are free and open question because we have to try to understand the, the processes with an art shows us suddenly on that's why i think dramaturgy is so favorite as an example for all these uh, you know indian disciplines uh, indian interest in aesthetics because once on the stage in that particular spotlight you pick up a mug and the mug is not the real mug it's just, uh, it's, it's it's a roll of a mug something more right there is some extra qualities attached to it it's the same uh, worldliness becomes an other worldliness right so you are negotiating between values and that's where the axiological framework comes in but if your commitment to the process is you know a very different thing trying to understand my my commitment to understanding aesthetics is metaphysical the understanding the nature of something as it comes to us through experiences then your understanding of aesthetics as a thesis is very open it's a wide field every you know uh, there's the only way in which an artist can understand the world you would think as a creative person aesthetics cannot be tagged under only the judgmental system of values and one category aesthetics and phenomenology come closer and so this is yes uh, something that i am exploring but uh, the the fight for accepting or considering phenomenology itself as some kind of a valid discourse or discipline these are like endless uh, you know uh, categorization quibbles like somebody wants this to be the main discipline somebody doesn't want that and as uh, shrinu has rightly pointed out you know the rasa people the uh, alankar people the kavya people everyone will have their own 
it's fun because that shows their commitments it it reveals their metaphysical philosophical commitments if you value something more you will look at the world in a way that what you value more matters to you right so any way you will put those lenses in place and then look at it and that's where these schools emerge so i mean i align uh, towards understanding phenomenological traditions and so this makes sense uh, as a process more than one category that relates to maybe something very specific so uh, i mean i don't know if that answers your question but uh, i would just say when you look at textbooks that uh, categorize disciplines and sub disciplines and so on question it right away because most textbook knowledge also inherits a sort of a western canon dis dis differentiation so first of all in the, in the south asian way of looking at things object and subject are very deeply entwined when you're looking at object subject to be deeply entwined which means metaphysics epistemology are not divorced from each other you can't look at one without looking at the others very separate clean neat things if they entwine then your neat categorization is flawed you'll have you may also want to think that the model of categorization should be different why not they foreground background it why is it always that flow chart right so that is the beginning of how we start looking at knowledge like you are given a flow chart you take it in you ingest it without questioning it but if it's uh, how about categorization where you just foreground background so everything has something in the background something in the foreground there is it's a very different way of categorizing so yeah I mean, that's my vague answer to your response thank you Thank you, Srajna, for that uh, 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 detailed and elaborate answer. And um, I don't think in terms of answers so much, it's more like a response, how you sort of, you know, respond, react, what does it make you feel and think these questions. I think Sharath has um, another question. Sharath, please go ahead. Uh, uh, hello. Uh, so I partially Hi. tried to uh, answer Ananda sir as a student of Indian classical music, in the sense that you you have illustrated uh, a photo uh, of uh, the uh, the paintings of Raga Meg. So in Indian classical mm. music, each swara is is treated as a deity, and a corresponding mm. color is given uh, to a deity. So uh, ragas are uh, you know classified into male and female ragas, and there are ragas and raginis. and each of them has a deity so there is metaphysics and uh, aesthetics uh, which is i mean one could say that it's very closely linked even uh, in the indian context so uh, and uh, my question flows uh, from there is in in the western scene is uh, is theology in the sense deification of aesthetics is is it uh, is it something that is common and uh, if you could elaborate mm -hmm. on on it uh, if if you have something to say uh, I'm very curious okay no it's a good point actually in the last the two slides that i missed uh one was a video on the art of ikebana okay because that so through that i was trying to talk about uh looking at every world uh, you know worldly objects every day our natural objects that are around us and how the japanese philosophy of ikebana informs this uh very simple act of arranging flowers from your garden but has deeply sort of uh, you know transcendental uh, interpretations they have guidelines they have like three lines one goes to the heaven one responds to man one responds to the earth so uh that was one and the other was uh, a video of kuriyattam which of course i'm you may try to engage with later or you should go and see a performance of kuriyattam considered as one of the former most forms of uh, you know uh, performative traditions uh, linked with sanskritic uh, poetics and, and then you have of course the offshoots you have kathakali yakshagana all uh, you know, uh, even bhutakola i mean of course bhutakola is all over uh, dakshin kannada so definitely you should go and there is definitely this underlying on this uh, you know understanding of uh, that that plan that play is where aesthetics happen becomes sacred quote and quote that other worldliness takes place there that there is and so the person who is 
making that performance, they enter that uh, stage or enter into that even that part of uh, the role. Uh, it's not connected to this world. It's a different world. And uh, notions of uh, sacredness emerge there. And this is not that different from uh, it. I mean, of course, the performativity is very different. The performative tradition in the West, I would not know of much, but there, it, the understanding of performative tradition were very different in terms of it was more consumeristic, entertainment oriented. But uh, the notion of the museum emerges from the idea of the church, definitely. So the history of the museum, one is a colonial legacy where the colonizers are, uh, you know, our seafarers went abroad, uh, went to exotic lands, collected curiosities, put them in their cabinets, exhibited them as. But then uh, the ways in which museums started emerging were very similar to how churches would function. So uh, you go to a church, the, uh, the key or the cue is in the spatial design of it. There is one, uh, there is this uh, like overlooming silence. There's a silence of the space. There's a very different aura in these architectural designed uh, places where you go and it is some distance. It is like having some distance from your real world, from the outside social scenario, right? And the same thing would be replicated in your old school, old style museums where people would go to appreciate art. A lot of your Renaissance painters were funded by the church. So there's a very practical relationship also. Your Titian painting, you will see in the chapels in Venice, when you enter in their lived condition, not in a museum. So the church is also performed as musicians, right? So, I mean, you have the correlation between theology and uh, even imagination, you know, it's a story that is depicted, is very close. And so uh, definitely, I think it has to do with the this play between imminent and transcendent. So that's why it keeps coming in. And, uh, that's why the church is so interested or our temples are so interested in replicating the same figures again, again, again. And you would wonder like, why it's the same thing? You can just go, I mean, it's the same thing, but they would do another new figure in of it or something else of it. One, the question remains is why they do it? Well, what is that that happens, right? So uh, even our craftsmen then consider themselves as sick or they have these moments where you know, uh, they talk about it in a very delicate way. It's deeply personal, deeply private. So uh, it's a good question to ask, but it exists. Uh, I think it has not to do with the, our, uh, again, it's a forced binary, the West and the East. If you go to the West, the West of the West will be East. So, uh, you know, but we are talking about Greco-European tradition is a different tradition, the South Asian, the Global South is uh, maybe has a different focus. The commitments may be different. And similarly, Africa has not been explored and African traditions are also very rich, very vast and have a very different kind of a philosophical commitment. There, the notion of sacred is also very uh, uh, different. So we must explore all of those as well. So. Sure, thanks. Thanks, sir. Um, any other questions from the participants? I think Srini had his hand up for a little while and then suddenly it was raised down. Um. Uh, I mean, uh, I have a question and it's not just for uh, just for uh, uh, Srajana, but there are three uh, pursuants in uh, phenomenological research. Uh, youth, Anima, Vivek and uh, Srajana. So, so uh, before that, I would like just to add uh, answer uh, being one uh, interested in uh, Sanskritic tradition. So the, my response to the uh, Ananda's point would be that uh, philosophy is not only uh, restricted or limited to darshana systems. So it's uh, in that sense, as both of you, uh, Saraj, uh, Sarajana and Tanima have pointed out uh, the importance of interdisciplinarity and uh, Oh, so in that sense, uh, philosophy is, as you also pointed out about uh, other knowledge uh, traditions, such as African knowledge traditions or uh, uh, 
uh, East Asian knowledge traditions and so on. So their concerns, uh, their worldviews, um, their uh, the the topics that they are discussing are uh, are, are looking at uh, different uh, perspectives with the different perspectives at different uh, objects. So in that sense, maybe. Uh, we cannot just limit uh, in Indian philosophy. I mean, even calling just Indian philosophy and then uh, this is one of the concerns even the modern contemporary philosophers have pointed out is that how it can be only limited to Sanskrit, uh, Sanskritic traditions. Why not Tamil, Bangla and so on are not concerned or considered in the categorization of Indian philosophy. So this is a larger debate, but because all these people are concerned with uh, different objects. They are dealing with different objects, these different subjects. And you three, maybe uh, it's particularly to Srajana and also it's to all three of you is that, is it possible? I mean, because you also brought out this uh, debate on subject and object in aesthetics, in phenomenology, is it possible to one aesthete, to one connoisseur, to have an objective experience, is it possible for them to have an objective experience or is it merely a subjective experience of what they, what they deal with, what they engage, what they encounter, to put it simple? Yeah, it's an unanswerable question because now again, we'll come back. See, uh, if we ask the question, is it possible for a person to have an objective experience vis-a-vis -vis having a subjective experience? Yes, it is possible because that person will be informed by uh, what is objectivity according to that person. And so that person will be fully entitled to have an objective experience. If that person subscribes to a universal system of rasa, uh, I think Rasa, for instance, the way I, in which my little meager knowledge of, uh, you know, I'm not a scholar of Sanskrit, but how I understand the role of Rasa theory is, is a matter of trying to systematize possible emotions in a way that can become as close to have, being objective as possible. So when a particular note is played in a particular manner, in a particular way, hope is that it would evoke the same kind of rasa in different people and that would then constitute what one may call objective if we are trying to look at this sort of uh, common ground there is a common ground that is possible right and but the very idea of objectivity is very different in uh, so but then there's also an idea of objectivity from the scientific understanding of objectivity where the subject is absent. There, it is a view from nowhere where to go take Nagel's line. There, it is a very different uh, presupposition. So in that way, it will be impossible to talk about that kind of an objective experience uh, because experience requires embodiment, right? So I think that depends on perspectives, but the way in which we pose questions sometimes also has the answer within it. So you already sort of had the, I mean, you would expect this answer, I guess, when you ask that, is it possible to have objective or subjective experience or it's always, because uh, I always see it as degrees, you know, a little bit like uh, the Bergsonian view, like uh, it's not like clear cut, the sense that begins, the sense that begins, one fades into other. So if we look at some, uh, you know, the ways in which the world exists, one fading into the other, then uh, possibilities will exist. Uh, but uh, I mean, really they're informed by our value systems, I think. And um, certain try to adhere, try to work on that. I mean, Rasa would be example. But the attitude theory, or the aesthetic attitude theory is a very subjective theory. Anything can be not object if you think or decide or you, your intention or attitude towards that object is that it should be not object. So, I mean, your whole conceptual traditions in our uh, practice, your aesthetic, you know, your Dada is surreal. There, it, it is a very different way of uh, understanding uh, something becoming aesthetic. 
so the way in which the aesthetic object is created itself has all these different ways in so i mean i don't have an answer to it but this is my response i think if i may just add on a little bit to this and since we have already mentioned the phenomenological tradition so many times um i mean uh, gadamer says this in his hermeneutical aesthetics that you know aesthetics is not simply or our experience of art is not simply you know limited to uh, let's say you know subjective <clears throat> pleasure it's about study of aesthetics reveals to us what um objectively shapes our subjective experiences there are certain linguistic mm. cultural social categories which are informing our subjective experience you know so these social and culture are objective categories in themselves so in so far we are sharing it with the whole, whole of humanity right so how these categories that we consider as objective categories are you know shaping our subjective pleasures for instance the whole notion of taste how a particular class of individuals are going to possibly like one kind of clothes mm. so i mean this is as trajna said it's a very it's it's not something that we can sum up in about 5 minutes or 10 minutes it's a session in itself how this whole thing works but yes so yeah exactly on that i mean you caught the pulse of it so hey hi uh if i may i just wanted to add one point um i was just thinking that i i i mean yeah so it's a big question it's it's something that is very difficult to answer but one thing that i think we can presume in in this in this discussion is that you know one cannot take the extreme stance that you know that uh, all the uh, all these experiences be it aesthetic experience or ethical experiences uh, all these experiences are subjective i don't think uh, it's easy to hold on to a, a you know epistemic solipsist position or or a moral solipsist position i think if we if we stick, stick to the view that you know a particular experience is, is completely mine if it's 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 fully subjective then i don't think there is any possibility for dialogue i don't think i can even express the fact that i am experiencing this particular thing to you uh, uh, with with an assumption that you will understand it so i think i think that at least can be rejected to begin with um, so i thought I, i'll just add this point yeah i mean rightly as i mean i'll just extend thanks vivek because aesthetics aesthetics presupposes at least one possibility of communication it can't become uh, i mean aesthetics is not possible without more than oneness no that's when i said that i was thinking the same way so this this uh position uh doesn't doesn't look uh logically possible for aesthetics to make uh, to happen so that's maybe one thing to consider and i must add thank you for recreating the manipal center for humanities mch environment to once again with the three of us having this small little discussion yeah i was about <laughs> to say that <laughs> i was about to say <laughs> that i feel a little uh, nostalgic and also i feel a bit uh, a lot sad that the p is not there but uh, seeing three of you was really nice peas here yeah, no we're all peas <laughs> <laughs> yes thanks well, Rima. anyway thank you so, I, i hope all of you have uh, sufficiently exhausted <laughs> go and eat something <laughs> i i think so yes and uh, thank you for overstaying as well since we agreed 3:30 to 5 and then uh, when discussions begin they don't seem to end so um, i i'm sure there's lot to think about after a lot of takeaways from this uh, today's session and with this we arrive at the conclusion of this session so let me begin by once again thanking shrajna for agreeing to do this session and for doing it in the most creative manner possible and um, even though it is a late afternoon session it is being carried out into the evening none of us we are exhausted yes but we have a lot of food for thought a lot of stuff to think about and um, take home So thank you everyone for being uh, here and if there are any queries anything that you'd like to you know ask uh, Srajna you can obviously let me know I will convey them I'll put you in touch with her if she agrees of course and 
you know that yeah, you always do. yeah so yes so let's wrap up this session here and we we'll